Colossians chapter 4. And uh, last week, I know we went a little past last week and, and, and stuff, but uh, and, and what I'm going to say is we actually concluded the, the real portion of putting on and, and uh, putting off and, and what's involved uh, in all of that. Uh, putting off things mentioned in, in chapters 3, verses 8 and 9. Putting on uh, even those things measured there, mentioned, mentioned, mentioned there. In verses 12 through 17, and as we, as we put on and as we put off, uh, it manifests itself in a change of attitude, uh, a change in, in, in attitude looking out and, and what people see, or at least what they ought to see, um, in us. And, and then in, in, in all of that, and then how that reflects, and we, we talked about several areas of relationships with the marriage, uh, the husband, the wife, the parental, the workplace, uh, in, in all of that, again, we are, we are told how we ought to, as believers, how we are to conduct ourselves one to the other in that relationship. The wife to the husband, the husband to the wife, the children to the parents, the parents to the children, uh, the slave, the servant, the master, um, uh, all of that. And so we've covered all of that. We've talked about all of that. But before we go uh, on, I, I just was thinking, there's, uh, there's one final thought that, that I'd like to, to uh, deal with here tonight. And, and it won't take too long, but I want to say this. These things, putting on and putting off, uh, if, you, if you make that decision to trust Christ uh, Saturday afternoon at 3 o'clock, Saturday afternoon at 3.05 or 3.10 or 3.30, that, those aren't going to be all put off and all that new stuff put on. Uh, it, it is not, it's not something that just happens automatically. Who we are in Christ, who we are in Christ, our position in Christ, that occurs the moment we put our faith and trust in Christ. At that very moment, and we mention it all the time, the Holy Spirit takes us and baptizes us into Christ, into Christ, and he seals us there. And in the book of Romans, Romans 6 and elsewhere, it talks about who we are in Christ Jesus and, and how we are identified with his death, burial, and his resurrection. And so all of that is there. But even in Romans chapter 6, on two occasions, we are then told to yield ourselves over to God, yield ourselves over to the Spirit of God that is within us. And, and so the, the one thing we have, to, we have to understand is, like I said, the moment we're saved, it doesn't mean necessarily that just like that, I'm going to walk away from all of those things that I've been doing, perhaps for, for many years, that automatically I am putting off and putting on. It's, it's true. I'm not going to say that someone who, I'm just going to give one example, and I'm not saying that it's, uh, I, I don't know, someone who smokes cigarettes. I'm not talking about, I'm not, it's just an example. The moment they accept Christ as, as Savior, um, at that very moment, the, the urge for the cigarette is gone. Now, you, are you hear of those kinds of things happening. But the rule is different. The rule is different. Sometimes it takes time. To, and, and, not just, and not just cigarettes, but just anything that is is of the world just just our unrighteous life uh, uh, things the the worldly aspect of our lives the fleshly aspect of our lives uh, it is true at the moment of salvation a person may be on some emotional high and may sound different for a few days but then the high wears off and sometimes they'll return to their old ways 
and 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 this isn't because they weren't saved. This isn't because the decision they made wasn't real. This is because Christianity is not based upon our feelings. It's not based on our emotions. Do we feel saved? But rather it's based upon our faith and our faith alone. That's where it is. Then as we as we then walk with the Lord, as we then are in the Word of God, as we are then feeding that spirit that is within us, as we are doing that, as we yield ourselves over to him, uh, then, then we can begin to see those areas in our, in our life through our biblical eyesight, our biblical understanding, and we can see those areas and we can begin to put those off. To put those off. And, and let me say this, too. We can't do it because of some legalistic fleshly system. Because that doesn't work. That doesn't work. Uh, look over to Ephesians chapter, uh, chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians chapter 5, um, Paul is talking about what, 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 what the, the, the Ephesian believers, um, he's talking about what they were and what they are. In verse 8, he says, for ye were sometimes darkness. So this is looking back. In, in, in their lives. Now he's talking to, to believers here, not, not to the unbelievers. They're still in darkness. He says, ye, talking to the church, the believers there, ye were sometimes darkness. But now you, you walk, ye walk in the Lord, walk as children of light. And so, so even here in Ephesians 4, talk, Paul is talking to the believers and he's urging them to a new way of life. We're going to address some of this at the conference on Friday. I, I think it's an area that's lacking in the body of Christ. And unfortunately, I think sometimes it's really lacking in those who champion the message of grace. Those who message the champion of grace. Um, I'll probably say it Friday or Saturday, but I think very often those who champion the, the, the message of God's grace would tell you that grace is not a license to sin. But very often in their practice, in their walk, it would appear as such. It would appear as such. Ye were sometimes darkness, but now ye are light in the Lord. And because you are light in the Lord, now he says, walk as children of light. And he's telling the, the believers there, this is the way you now, this is how you need to conduct yourself. So he, he's saying what I, what I just said earlier, you need to, this is the way that we ought to, this is what we ought to be moving toward moving toward. And he says, for the fruit of the Spirit is all goodness and righteousness and truth. The, the outworking of the Spirit, this is the outworking of the Spirit in our lives, is goodness, righteousness, and truth. Goodness, righteousness, and truth. It's not the flesh. The flesh isn't going to change our lives. It's the Spirit of God in us that as we feed that and as we rely upon that, it is that that is going to come out of us. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. It's the fruit of the Spirit working through us that proves or manifests or demonstrates what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. 
one of the hardest areas. And for those who suffer from addiction or those who suffer from any kind of, uh, you know, all addiction isn't, isn't limited to drugs and alcohol. Addiction can be pornography. Addiction can be sex. Addiction can be Coca-Cola. Uh, you know, it can be anything that's, that consumes our lives. Consumes our lives and really is what we live for. I, I'm living for that next drink. I'm living for that next, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's this, I'm, I'm holding that out. That is, that is chief in my life. And he says, and so then he says, have no fellowship or partnership or association with the unfruitful works of darkness. And, and, and I've often said, you know, to, to a person who's fighting uh, some addiction, when they, when they get their life cleaned up, the first thing they need to do is establish a whole new set of friends, a whole new friend, set of associates. They need to associate with a whole different group of people. They cannot continue to associate with those old friends, those friends that were drinking or, or drugs or, you know, pornography or whatever it is. Those people who are so linked to that will we'll suck you right back into it. We'll suck you right back into it. And Paul says, this is what you were, but this is not who you are. And because this is not who you are, you need to stop hanging with those people that still are that, because they're going to draw you right back into them. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful work of, works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it's a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are, are, are uh, reproved are made manifest by the light. By the light. By the Spirit. By the Word of God. By that coming out of us. Even to speak, uh, uh, made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest. Arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Now, in, in many ways, he, uh, he, remember, he's talking to the believers here. He's talking to believers here. And he, and he says, you need to get up. You, you, need to stop, you need to stop what you're doing. You need to get up. Arise uh, from, from, the, from your deadness, and, and Christ shall give thee light. For the believer. Even for the believer, the believer, ha as the church, the body of Christ, as believers, whatever it is, talking about addiction or not, the, the body of Christ cannot lay around silent. The, the body of Christ has been given a job to do. Now, all those other things can keep us from doing that job. But sometimes we just we just lay around in apathy. We'll let somebody else do it. I, I'm I'm 65 years old. I did my thing. Let the young people do it. Let the young people do it. Now I, I, I've said this lately. The church in in North Branch, um, they're all 70 and up, except for maybe one or two, 70 and up. And, and they wanted to have vacation Bible school in the church. Now, there are no kids in the church. But those people, those people took flyers and canvassed the neighborhoods all around the church. They're, they're walking door to door and uh, advertising the Bible school coming. And, and, you know, a lot of people, 75, 80 years old, walking the streets. And, and, and that, the, that's what he's saying. We need, we, the time is there. We need to get up and get busy. God has given to us the message of reconciliation. That's, that's our task, to be sharing the, the word of reconciliation, to be sharing the gospel of what Christ has done for people, to be sharing the word of God with people. It doesn't matter how old we are. 
doesn't matter how old we are. The job remains the same. And he says, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly. See? Not as, uh, not as fools. Remember, the fool has said in his heart, No, God. The fool in Scripture always describes the world, the unrighteous, the lost. And, and he says, walk carefully, not as fools, not like the world, but as wise, but as the wise. Verse um, 18, 16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, and be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Be not drunk with wine. And simply talking about is control. When you are drunk with wine, drunk with drugs, drunk with anything. He's talking about the fact, the fact that you are no longer in control of your faculties. You're no longer under control of your faculties. You will do and say things that tomorrow morning, when that's all wore off, that you have no idea what you did. And, 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 and what Paul's saying for the believer, no, no. He says, be not drunk. Don't Surrender the control of your body. Don't control, uh, surrender the control of your mind to your mind to that which is fool, foolish, to that which is of the darkness, to that which is of ungodliness, to that which is unrighteousness. But he said here, but be filled and that word filled means to come under the control of. To come under the control of. Under the control of the Spirit. Of the Holy Spirit. And that again, as I said in Romans 6, comes as we yield ourselves over to God. As we yield ourselves over to Him. Uh, a friend read uh, today in, in uh, church... Uh, a friend read a passage that I know is familiar to all of us here, but Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I... Romans 6, understand, when Christ died, in our identification with that death, we died. We died. And he says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. The, the, the real life in us is not us. It's, it's Christ living through us. And, and Paul says the same thing. Uh, in, in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, he says, when Christ, who is our life? Who is our life? And, and so, so we have all of that. And, and so in Ephesians uh, 5, he's talking about the Holy Spirit who now resides within us, that, that presence of the Spirit that becomes ours the moment we trust in Christ. Now we are to yield over to him Yield our lives over to God and allow that to be lived out through us. Allow him to live out through us so that the world, the world sees and hears Christ living in us. Not, not our flesh, not the old guy, but Christ living within us. And, and he says here, we are to be filled by the Holy Spirit. We are to be uh Yielding ourselves over to him. And, and that word there, be ye filled with the Holy Spirit, is, is actually, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, 
it's in the it's in the present. It's an ongoing process. Be ye continually being filled with the Spirit. Now, see, that's the. Now, let me just say here, there are some people who look at this as there are there's this, there's a thing such as the indwelling of the Spirit, and then there's the filling of the Spirit. The moment we accept Christ, the moment we put our faith and trust in that finished work of Christ, the Holy Spirit takes us and puts us in Christ, and then the Holy Spirit seals us, and the Holy Spirit takes up residence within us. We are then indwelt by the Holy Spirit. But that's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about here the indwelling of the Spirit. The indwelling of the Spirit is a permanent uh, situation. The Holy Spirit is never going to be removed from us, taken from us. We are sealed in Christ till the day of redemption. I, I, the moment you put your faith and trust in Christ, at that very moment, you are saved, sealed, and secure in Christ. Nothing can separate you from the love of God that is found in Christ. But Paul here is not talking about the indwelling of the Spirit. He's talking about the empowerment of the Spirit, the enabling of the Spirit, allowing the Spirit to fill us and control us, to take control of our lives, our ears, our eyes, our lips, our hands, our mind, our feet. It's time of being surrendered over to, to the Lord and, and surrender ourselves over to the, uh, to the Holy Spirit and allowing the Holy Spirit to live through us. And he says here, can, um, in verse 18, but be filled or, but be ye filled or being filled or continually being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's an ongoing process. So I asked D.L. Moody one time after a service uh, that he had been speaking at, and he said, why must the believer be continually being filled? And his answer was, because we have too many leaks. We have too many leaks, and that's and that's absolutely true. Uh, as long as we are in this form, in this body, in this flesh, we have we will have leaks. But what we need to do is allow the Holy Spirit to take control. And as the Holy Spirit takes control, then all of these things that we talk about, as far as being put on, we will put those things on. They will become who we are. And these things we talk about putting off they will be put off. And it doesn't mean that one day you get up, you take, you know, we talk about putting off is like putting on or putting off a jacket. It isn't like one day you get up and you take off the, the put off jacket and now everything is hunky-dory. No, that's not what it's talking about. But as we enable the spirit within us, as we surrender ourselves to his leading, as we're in the word of God and as we're feeding that, then that spirit is teaching us that Spirit is leading us, guiding us, teaching us. Uh, look over at Titus. Titus chapter three, uh, chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Uh, good evening to uh, Dave and Sylvia from down there in Pink Hill, North Carolina. Trust, I don't know how you did with the water, if you got dried out or blown around. But uh, uh, Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us, teaching us, that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, or this present world, present age. Teaching us. What, what's teaching us? It's the grace of God living through us. It's the grace of God through the Spirit living through us, teaching us then how to, all right, put off and put on. Put off and put on. And as we read something in Scripture and it says, you need to put this off, then as a believer, we need to then endeavor to put that off in our lives. We need to, to labor and allow the Spirit to enable us to deal with that, whatever it is, to deal with that. And, and again, let me say this. Again, the, the fleshly a aspect of us, is it's going to fight that. Why? Because I like that. I like that. And, 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 and we may slip and fall, Kate. That's why we need to be in his word. 
That's why we need to be feeding, feeding his word, eating his word, being strengthened by his word um, in our lives, in our lives. So, I, you know, I just wanted to talk about that. I don't want anybody to think that if I got saved on Monday and Tuesday, I felt like whatever, that well, maybe I'm not saved. Uh, don't get that idea. If you truly, if you truly believe, if you truly said, yes, I believe, if you truly put your faith and your trust in that finished work of Christ on Calvary's cross, if that's, if that, if you truly did that and you meant that, then now the next step is through the work of the spirit. Now we start dealing with those issues in our lives, dealing with those issues uh, in our lives. All right, let's go back to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. And and uh, so we dealt with the masters. We come down to verse 2. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Uh, we talked about that uh, last night. Paul addresses the subject of prayer here. Uh, he presents something that uh, of which must we must make note. Uh, Paul urges the believers to pray, and and I w- I would urge I would urge you to pray. Be a prayer praying people. God speaks to us through His Word. We speak to God in prayer. Now it doesn't have to be an audible prayer. God knows our thoughts. God knows our minds. Um, we can we can pray to ourselves and, and, and so it's that's not what we're talking about you have to get down on your hands and knees to pray as we read before uh, Paul writes in, in, in uh, to the Thessalonians the pray without ceasing it's it's, it's it's a mindset that is always tuned in uh, to to pray to uh, to to say thank you uh, to to Pray for somebody, for a need. A need pops up. Even a name in your mind pops up and you say, you, you just pray for that person. Maybe there's a need at that moment for that person. And so we offer a prayer for that person. But he says here, continue in prayer uh, and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Now that word continue there means to persevere. To persevere. Uh, continue. Persevere. Press on. Um, have that prayer life, that fervent prayer life, uh, where you, where you, you take those prayers, those requests, and you lay them before the Lord. Now you could do a whole series on the idea of prayer, and the idea of prayer today. Um, but. He says here to be fervent, to continue in prayer, to persist uh, in prayer. Keep at it. Don't don't quit. Uh, like I said in First Thessalonians five, he says, "Pray, pray without ceasing." The whole concept is a prayerful mindset uh, with God. Uh, doesn't doesn't matter what you're doing. You know, he's always there and you're always mindful of him and instantly running things by him in prayer. It's like a computer uh, in our heads. But then he says, with thanksgiving, with thanksgiving. How often do we pray with thanksgiving? Now, what are we thankful for? What are we thankful for? Well, number one, have you ever seen prayer answered? Sure. Sure. Now, if that does nothing else, it does tell us that God does hear and answer prayer. Now, I, I may have said last Sunday, God, I believe God answers every prayer. Every prayer. What we have to learn is that Every prayer isn't answered with a yes or isn't answered exactly the way we want it to be answered. But every prayer has an answer. And sometimes it will be yes. It may, like I said, it may not be exactly what I want. I think I gave the illustration. I wanted a red Cadillac and I got a blue 
you go, or a uh, nowadays a, a blue Volkswagen. Although some people might like Volkswagens, so I've offended them now. But you know, I asked for this, and I got this. What I really was asking for was selfish. What I was asking for was reliable transportation. And that's what I got. I just didn't get the great big expensive one. I got the less expensive one. But, but to be thankful. And then there are times when God says no. And God will close the door on that. And, and, and God, no, no. And then there are times that God says, not now. Wait. Wait. And so we have to understand those kinds of things. But, but whatever it is, we pray with thanksgiving. Praying and asking God to, to uh, thanking God for, for the answer even before it comes. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6, Paul says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Let your request be made known unto God. You know, you could now have a friend or someone and you, you say to your friend, uh, would you give me $500 and I thank you for that. You go to the Lord and you, and you, and you, you, you go to your, your Heavenly Father and you lay a need before Him. You have a prayer and you put that before Him. Whatever it, is, whatever it is, you put that before him and you're thankful. You're thankful for who he is. We're thankful for his grace, thankful for his mercy, thank you for his, his love, thankful for all of that. And I thank you for the answer that you're going to give me. I thank you for that. And, and it may not be the answer you want. But we need to come to that point where our reliance is upon him and our trust is in him and we recognize who he is. And so as we pray, realizing that he loves us and cares for us, but as we pray that he is going to respond to me and what the way he responds to me is going to be righteous. It's going to be holy. It's going to be right. And if I believe in who he is, and I believe in his love for me and his care for me, then I'm also thankful to know that what he gives me is really what I need at this moment. And therefore, I'm thankful. I'm thankful. And I think this is where many of us fall short. We're thankful only when we get what we absolutely ask for. We're only thankful when we get the red Cadillac. Anything else falls short. That's not what I prayed for. Why should I be thankful for something I didn't pray for? But in both of these verses, the thanksgiving is part of the prayer. It's part of the prayer. It's offered before anything else. It's offered before the amen. And in the Philippians passage uh, that we read from, you know, continue on down for that. Uh, again, there's that whole section where God is dealing with with uh, the, the, the idea of prayer and, and the, the peace of God that comes. You know, when we take, we take our prayers and our supplications to God and, and he, he gives us a peace about it. He says, let your thanksgiving, let your prayers be known with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God and the God and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep or guard your hearts and minds through Christ. Everything God deals with, deals with the heart and the mind. The thinking process, the emotional process. 
And, and what God has promised is we come to him in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. He's going to give us a peace, a peace that, that will keep our hearts and minds. And, and then in verse 8, he talks about our thinking process. Thinking on these things. And, and I've, I've said to it before, uh, I think what Paul's talking about there is the word of God. Every, not, there's only one thing in, in this world that we have that meets every one of those. And that's the Word of God. That's the Word of God. And so at the end of that verse, he says, think on these things. Think on these things. So that's, that's our thinking process. But that's not where it ends with that. He says, those things which ye have both learned and, and received and heard and seen in me. So now Paul's talking about all these things that I've taught you. All of these things that I've taught you. Here's the word of God. All that you've learned from the word of God. Now do. Do. And the God of peace shall be with you. And too often, you know what we do? We get so wrapped up in that need. And so wrapped up in the cause, the issue. So wrapped up and we don't see the answer just you know like that we don't see, we don't sense anything and oh oh and we sit around and and we stew about it and we worry over it even though the word of god says be anxious for nothing we worry about it and and paul says no wait a minute wait a minute no 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 don't sit around and stew about it take the word of god and the things that I've taught you, the things that you have heard in my life and seen in me. Remember, Paul has given a thorn in the flesh. Paul had prayed three times and it'd be removed. And God said, my grace is sufficient for thee. Paul had been shipwrecked. Paul had, been, uh, had suffered. He'd been stoned, left for dead. All of these things, which in, in, in the, to the church of Corinth, he calls but a light affliction. But in all of those things... Paul says, look at my life. Look at my life. Look at who I am. Look at who I was. And I counted all as dung that I may win Christ. Paul's whole life, his whole vision was Jesus Christ and him crucified. And he's directing us. He's directing us in these times when we go to him in prayer. We go to the Lord in prayer. That we ought to remain focused. Focused on Christ, focused on his word, focused on, on the example of, 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 in this case, the example of the Apostle Paul, thinking on these things, the things that he has taught us, the things that he, they, we have learned. He says, now, you get, to, you get busy and you put them to practice in your life. You do them and the God of peace will be with you. The God of peace will be with you. And I think so very often, we aren't fervent in our prayers. We aren't continuous in our prayers. We don't have thanksgiving. And, and, and we get discouraged when we don't instantly see the answer to the issue. And God just wants us to know tonight that I'm here. I, I care. I love you. I've invited you to come before my throne of grace. I've invited you to come and make your prayers and your requests known unto me. I've invited you here for that. I understand. I love you. And I want to hear. And, and I will respond. And our response to that has to be thankfulness. Thanksgiving. It has to be focused on the Word of God. What does the Word of God say? Think on these things, and the God of peace will be with us. And you know, remember where Paul is when he's writing this. He's in jail. What's he in jail for? Preaching the gospel. Preaching the gospel. Preaching the gospel of the grace of God. These people. Continue on. Continue on. 
Be constant in prayer. Persevere in prayer. Watch with thanksgiving. With thanksgiving. Let me just ask you, friend, tonight, where are you tonight? Where are you tonight? What is your life tonight? Are you full of anxiety? Worry? Are there things in your life that are just tearing you apart? You need to know tonight that in Christ there is peace. As you give that over to him. You know, Peter writes, casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. Do you believe that tonight? Do you really believe the word of God tonight? Do you really believe the word to the point that as I put my faith and trust in Christ, as I put my faith in the word of God, as I'm in the word of God, as I'm feeding the spirit within me, God is going to give me peace. But we need to surrender the issue over to him and allow him to work it. And surrender it to him with thanksgiving, with thankful hearts, with thankful hearts. And where are you tonight? Do you know Christ as Savior? Have you taken that step of faith, of belief in your life? I didn't ask you if you've been baptized. I didn't ask you if you've done some ceremony or some sacrament. No. You know, friend, man's religion, man's religion will never get you to heaven. But God has promised through his Son, Jesus Christ, that he has paid the price of your sin tonight. He has paid that price in full on Calvary's cross. Christ died for your sins. He was buried. The sin issue has been removed. He was raised for your justification. He has brought you to the point tonight where you are savable. And not by what you do. Because he's done it all. He's done everything necessary for you tonight. All that's left for you is to believe that he did it for you. That he did it for you. And the word of God says the very moment you put your faith and trust in that finished work of Christ. At that very moment, the Holy Spirit takes you and places you into Christ and seals you there. And seals you there. And nothing, nothing can ever break that seal. You are saved, sealed, and secure simply because you put your faith and trust in the one who died for you, was buried, and rose again. That's it. That's it. And when you take that simple step of faith, my friend, you will pass from death unto life. Well, listen. I trust if you've never taken that step of faith in your life, you've never said, yes, I believe Christ died for me. I'm putting my faith, my trust, my belief in what he did, his finished work, his death, burial, and rest. I'm going to trust that and that only for my salvation. If you've never taken that step of faith right now in the quietness of wherever you are, You can take that simple step of faith, trust in Christ, and you will be secured in him, sealed and secure in him. And listen, 